had to do for uh, quite a bit of today is talk about Sun Tzu's realism and how Sun Tzu uh, matches up with Machiavelli, with some of Machiavelli's ideas, so that we can see realism through these two uh, thinkers. Sun Tzu from ancient China, from a very different time and place, but he does share some ideas with uh, this Machiavelli from Renaissance Italy and uh, thinks a lot alike in a way. And uh, it's sort of counterbalanced to the, as I said, the video's presentation of Sun Tzu is having ideas that are very different from Western ideas. Um, you, you know, these ideas are a little more universal than that. We even see some of these ideas coming out in, uh, in the thought of surrounding Socrates. So some of the challengers to Socrates were realists and had some of the same ideas. Um, they're human ideas, you might say, so I'm going to focus on that uh, as well today. Uh, so I want to just look at several points where, they, where their ideas seem to intersect. Okay? And one is, is, is in this importance of good leadership. You may remember that Machiavelli is always talking about how the prince should appear to be good, that he should appear to be uh, religious, that he, you know, honest, and all these good qualities. And not only that, which gains acceptance from people, but he ought to actually do some good things for people. Okay, not for their sake, in his view, but for the prince's sake. But nevertheless, to provide them with safety to reward their, uh, you know, their enterprise, their, their uh, hard work, to uh, make them feel as though they, they belong in the community. All, right? all of these things uh, are good for the people. Uh, and Machiavelli <coughs> recommends them because he knows that if a leader is accepted by the people, is truly legitimate, then the leader's going to have a lot less trouble. He's going to be able to be uh, much more successful, not put as much time into trying to control his own people. Well, Sun Tzu is looking at the general and his troops, not so much the leader and the, uh, and the, the citizens, but the general and his troops, although he does talk to a certain extent about political leadership, too, and the relationship that the generals ought to have with political leadership. Um, but he talks about how a leader, whatever kind of leader it is, whether it's a political leader or a general, uh, he says they have to uh, follow the moral law, as he puts it. But as you saw when we looked at this, this is one thing we looked at a couple of uh, meetings ago, the moral law, when he defines it, means that the leader has to be seen as doing things for the good of his troops. Okay has to be seen as legitimate, as a legitimate leader, so somebody who has the qualities that are, nat that are actually necessary to lead. He can't be seen as somebody who's in that, who doesn't know what he's doing, he's going to screw up. Okay? He has to be admired and respected by his troops. That's what Sun Tzu means by the moral law. Okay? The acceptance of those who follow uh, is important to him as well. And one bit of advice that he gives that helps the general or military leader to get that acceptance sounds similar to Machiavelli's point as well. He says such a leader needs to be firm and predictable. Remember that uh, Machiavelli says the prince needs to be like a stern father. He needs to, to you know, lay down the law. He needs to be very consistent in how he applies the law so that it's not, ar doesn't be, it's not seen as arbitrary. It doesn't appear capricious. Okay? Uh, but rather, it makes sense to people and they know if they obey it, they'll be great. And if they disobey it, they have to fear uh, the, you know, significant punishment. Well, uh, Sun Tzu says about the soldiers on page 76, if soldiers are punished, here, let me put this up for a second. If soldiers are punished before they have grown attached to you, they will not prove submissive. And unless submissive, they will be practically useless. Okay? You have to get that attachment. It doesn't mean that they have to love the leader, but they do have to respect the leader. If when the soldiers have become attached to you, punishments are not enforced, they will still be useless. Okay? Remember, Machiavelli also says, you know, you, if you're only loved, you may uh, receive only contempt from the people around you, okay? Because they'll start to disregard you and not respect you. So Sun Tzu is asking for that same balance. You need to be respected but feared. 
Therefore, soldiers must be treated in the first instance with humanity, but kept under control by iron discipline. This is one of the certain roads to victory. Okay? So he understands that about uh, human nature as well. And especially in the situation of war, in a crisis, when people uh, are not able to always think deeply and long about what they should do, this is particularly important uh, for the military discipline. So that's one point of comparison, uh, and a pretty good one. Uh, also, Sun Tzu uh, refers in his own way to prudence. Okay? Machiavelli has this prudentia. He has, get, he has this idea of prudence. He actually uses that word. It doesn't exactly translate okay, into ancient Chinese. However, there are ideas that come out in uh, Sun Tzu's works, uh, in his work here, that uh, similar has a similar feel to it. It has to do with understanding human nature generally, understanding yourself, and understanding your enemy well. Okay. One piece of advice that he gives, of a you know pretty general nature, but it gets to this idea of you have to understand, you have to take the time to study. Okay. He says the successful general makes calculations ahead of time. In other words, he sits down and he thinks long and hard about what he should do, the various options that he has, the consequences that may flow from each of those options if he selects them. Okay? He needs to think several steps beyond his current point and think of the, ver the various things that could go wrong as well as those things that could go right and how he might guard against them or what he might do if they happen. Okay? If he spends this time initially to plan, to calculate, as, as Sun Tzu puts it, then he will avoid the disastrous last-minute scrambling, the disastrous, oh, what do we do now, which leads to poor decision-making. Okay? So not, does it, not only does the soldier need to be drilled so that he does what he's supposed to do, okay, but the general needs to drill his, himself. In his mind, he needs to go through these steps and plan uh, and anticipate the problems that may arise. And that way, he'll be ready, no matter what the contingency is, as much as possible. And remember that uh, Machiavelli also says, when some disaster strikes, when you get some piece of bad news, you need to have thought about how you might make that into good news for you. Okay? You have to have that, that frame of mind. And he also talks about studying your situation, including your terrain, uh, you know, and, and your enemy. All right. Magdal, or, excuse me, Sun Tzu also says, uh, know your troops. Okay? And this is this comes back to knowing human nature as well. He observes that if people have to deal with a prolonged conflict, Okay. Even if it's not going badly, uh, nevertheless, they start to get discouraged. So he, uh, he advises trying to do things quickly because the troops will get discouraged if they have to be there for a long time. All right? uh, and again, whether it's going well or whether it's going poorly isn't the problem as much as that people just get tired. They get tired, and the more tired they get, the more discouraged they get, and that mood of discouragement can then affect their performance. Okay? So as much as possible, he wants uh, the general to do things as quickly as possible. He says, thus though we have heard of stupid haste in war, cleverness has never been associated with long delays. Okay? There is no instance of a country having been benefited from prolonged warfare. Okay? So if there's a way that you can speed up your plan, if there's a way that you can accomplish your goals more quickly, this is the way to maintain morale. All right? And not, know, not only know your own troops, but know your enemy. And, and for the most part, I think Sun Tzu assumes the same aspects of human nature apply. Your enemy is no different than yourself. They're all human beings. They all tend to think the same way, react the same way. You get the sense from, from Sun Tzu that he doesn't think that this varies a great deal. All right? 
So you can predict the enemy's moods too. If the enemy has been, been bogged down in a particular spot for a long time, or has been out in the field, away from away from home for a long time, you can predict that the soldiers will be tired, that they'll be discouraged. Okay, even if they're still getting supplies, even if uh, they haven't lost the, the battles, still the longer that they are out there, the more susceptible, the more vulnerable they are. Uh, and there are other predictable moods. In other words. Check yourself and how you feel, okay, and how you think things are going in a particular circumstance. And you probably know that your enemy is going to feel the same way, all right? So uh, use that against him. Think about what he's thinking, what he's feeling. Uh, and emotions for Sun Tzu are important. Uh, he says on page 67, Now a soldier's spirit is keenest in the morning. By noonday it has begun to flag, and in the evening his mind is bent only on returning to camp. A clever general therefore avoids an army when its spirit is keen, but attacks it when it's sluggish and inclined to retreat. This is the art of studying moods. Okay? So even during one day, he knows that people are at their strongest in the morning, and that as the day goes on, they get more tired, and so, this would require you to uh, discipline your army to where it can do its best when the enemy is at its worst. Of course, that's the hard part. Okay? Um, so psychology is important, and it's important to Machiavelli as well. In this case, knowing your people and knowing what they're likely to think. Remember Machiavelli saying, you know, nothing succeeds like success. If you succeed at whatever you're trying to do, uh, they will admire you and be happy, and it doesn't matter what you, how you've managed to obtain that. Okay? That's an observation about human nature and psychology. So both of them are very keen on this and studying people and how they react in situations and how they feel. Okay. Um, flexibility is important to Sun Tzu, just as it is to Machiavelli. <coughs> You remember that for Machiavelli, flexibility has a lot to do with your ability to detach yourself from, one, morality, okay, uh, and two, your own personal feelings and emotions. Okay? Being detached from moral principles which may otherwise drag you down into doing something you, you shouldn't do, or your own feelings. Now, uh, Sun Tzu mentions this particular instance where uh, a general or a leader needs to be detached from his feelings, needs to think about every situation as an opportunity again. When you captured soldiers, okay, your first thought is not to be kind to them, especially if they have not been kind to you, okay, but rather to either kill them or uh, imprison them, torture them, okay? Uh, because you're angry, right? because they hurt you and your and your people. But Nagi, or, uh, Sun Tzu says uh, you have to think about them too as a potential weapon. Everything should be seen as a potential weapon. And how much more of a weapon do you have when you're kind to the enemy's troops once you capture them? and win them over, okay, if that's possible. Uh, so he has to disregard his feelings for them, forget about what they've done, at least to this extent, so that he can, um, he can use them for propaganda. He may even be able to release them, or they may even fight on his side. Okay? But if they go back and they say, look, you know, they didn't actually do any harm, uh, that's not going to, to help the enemy's cause. It's going to help your cause. Um, here's a good place where Sun Tzu talks about the need to detach yourself from your feelings and remain flexible. This is on page 70. He says, there are five dangerous faults which may affect a general. Recklessness, which leads to destruction. Cowardice, which leads to capture. A hasty temper can be provoked by insults, a delicacy of honor that is sensitive to shame, an over-solicitude for his men, uh, caring too much about how they feel in that case, which exposes him to worry and trouble, 
These are the five besetting sins of a general. Ruinous to the conduct of wars. Okay? Some of them are directly applied to the point that we're making here. A hasty temper. Okay? You've got to control your temper. Right? Uh, delicacy of honor. That's adhering too much to morality, to this code of conduct that says, I shouldn't do this, I can't do that. Okay? You have to be willing, if necessary, to violate that, that uh, code of honor. Okay? Recklessness. Uh, is, is always wrong. Being reckless means that you're not thinking enough. You're just doing what you feel. So realists of all times have always advised, put your feelings aside. You know, have to be kind of steely in your decisions. Then you'll be able to make <coughs> rational decisions. But if you're making a decision with your emotions, it's almost always going to be bad. He also advises more practically, more under, I guess more understandably, adjusting to circumstances. You have to adjust to what is actually in front of you. Okay? And he spells it out, uh, which sometimes can be a little bit irritating in a way, but uh, it is a manual. Okay? And he says, uh, it is the rule in war, for instance, if our forces are ten to the enemy's one to surround him. This seems to make sense to me. If five to one attack him. If twice as numerous, to divide our army into two. If equally matched, we can offer battle. If slightly inferior in numbers, we can avoid the enemy. If quite unequal in every way, we can flee from him. Okay? It's common sense. Hence, hence though, an obstinate fight may be made by a small force. In the end, it must be captured by the larger force. So, uh, you know, Sun Tzu is not one to argue, you know, the fight regardless if the uh, fight is winnable. You need to calculate whether you can possibly win it. Okay? If there's no chance, then Sun Tzu seems to be arguing, run away, go, you know, find it, fight another day, uh, because the survival is important. So, flexibility. Another piece of advice which is emphasized so much in Machiavelli is the art of deception, using deception or as Machiavelli puts it, the fox, as opposed to the lion. Uh, and we've already talked about Machia uh, uh, Sun Tzu's statement here, all warfare is based on deception. Okay. That was also emphasized in the video on Sun Tzu. And he really means that. That's not, and this is something the video brought up, that is not always the way, or usually the way, the American military has seen warfare. So there is a difference there between the general culture of the American military and this statement. Okay? The American military has always, I think, been more inclined to do straight conventional uh, warfare. And when it hasn't, you know, it's had to adapt at times. But during uh, World War II, you know, classic frontal conventional warfare. Um, but, and, and I'm not saying that Sun Tzu would go against that, but what he is saying is there are times when it is not possible or not desirable to confront your enemy head on or to be open about how you attack. Okay? Sometimes you need to confuse them. You need to, in effect, play games with your enemy. Okay? So he gives uh, some advice here. He says, simulate a dis disorder in your own troops. Okay? Postulates perfect discipline. If you can, in other words, make the enemy believe that you are in a state of disorder, that will, uh, that will put your enemy off. They won't uh, be as afraid of you, then you'll be able to attack. Simulated fear postulates courage. Okay? Again, if you can make your enemy believe you're afraid of him, so much the better. This goes against natural instincts. If you're strong and if you have courage, you don't really want your enemy, you don't think about, well, how can I make him think I'm afraid of him? Okay? That comes, it's a little bit of a second nature, right? Uh, but it can be, uh, it can be developed. Okay? The best army is that which is capable of, 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 of behaving as though it fears the enemy for the sake of maybe coming around and attacking in some other way later while the enemy is off guard. Uh, simulated weakness postulates strength. 
this is one of those pieces of advice that Sun Tzu gives that can uh, blend over into the rest of life, too, as that uh, woman was saying on the video. If you're strong enough to appear weak and not care what people think, okay, but only care about what you're going to do, it really is a personal strength. Okay? If you care less about what people think and about your outward reputation as your ultimate goals, it can give you a great deal of strength. Um, the person who is too preoccupied with their, uh, you know, whether people admire them at any given point in time can make some pretty dreadful mistakes. So many, many bits of advice Sun Tzu gives can spill over, but this is one uh, where you can see it quite clearly. Sun Tzu calls subtlety and secrecy the divine or heavenly art. Okay. Isn't that interesting? Even Machiavelli doesn't go this far. Okay. <laughs> he separates the two. He says, well, you've got God and religion all over here, but when it comes to politics, um, you have to do these things. And the two are kind of like in different categories for Machiavelli. Now, when, uh, when Sun Tzu speaks like this, we don't know exactly what, what he meant or how seriously he meant this, but he seems to be playing a little bit with the idea of what heaven requires or what the moral law really is. Okay? And he does seem to understand that sometimes uh, you cannot be honest if you are to be successful. Okay? You cannot be truthful and you cannot adhere to what God or the gods would like you or how they're portrayed as liking you to be. Okay? <coughs> So uh, he does seem to question, and Machiavelli does that too. Remember when Machiavelli uses Moses as an example, not of pious, godly leadership, but rather of uh, calculating use of religion. And he rewrites the Moses story okay, uh, until it becomes a sort of political fable about how to manipulate people. Well, and, and that's pretty shocking. You know, Machiavelli kind of goes pretty far there. Uh, Sun Tzu, in his own way, may be bringing up the same sort of questions. He certainly isn't saying you should not. Okay? Uh, Confucius, remember Confucius, he would say, no, no, you should not lie. You should not deceive people. We should be, we should be developing leaders of good character who train their citizens and their soldiers, their generals, to be good people who do not do these things. Much more likely, Sun Tzu questions uh, that because his focus is so much on military success and on dealing with the enemy and what the enemy will do. And as we'll see, Sun Tzu believes the enemy knows all this. Or at least he, he, he says, we must assume the enemy knows all this and will behave in the same way. See, And that's why we have to, too. This is Machiavelli's reason for why we set morality aside. Because we can't do, we can't be rigidly good in a world where people, other people are not. Another point of comparison and compatibility is this idea that force is a lesser strategy than deception and other means of getting uh, the job done. Okay? Deception is emphasized precisely because both Machiavelli and Sun Tzu believe that it is better to accomplish your goals without using the force. If you can, it, it shows more mastery and more skill and it's better for everybody. Fewer people die, uh, less expenses paid. Okay? So Sun Tzu says the supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. You remember that story that uh, was told in the video on Sun Tzu about the entire army that cut its throat, their, they cut their throats and sent the other enemy fleeing. That hopefully is an apocryphal story and I'm not sure that that story would be one that Sun Tzu would approve of because the point of not using force is hopefully to save your people not to slay them, okay? <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, it does it does exemplify the use of of psychology. They scared the heck out of 
of the enemy, right? Uh, just by, they were horrified. But um, it doesn't do so well as far as, as getting to this point, all right? Um, he wants, if possible, for the general to fight without using force so that his troops are still intact, his country still safe, and they haven't had to pay as high a price. So he recommends indirect methods, uh, as he calls them, whenever possible. And there's such a range of indirect methods, and he does not list them all. But you can uh, think of some. He says, in all fighting, this is on page 55, the direct method may be used for joining battle. That's when you frontally attack, when you're coming face to face with your enemy. But indirect methods will be needed in order to ensure victory. Indirect tactics, efficiently applied, are inexhaustible as heaven and earth, unending as the flow of rivers and streams, like the sun and the moon, they end their course but to begin anew. Like the four seasons, they pass to return once more. That's high praise, okay? They're, these indirect methods are inexhaustible, he says, because if one thing doesn't work, there's always another thing you can try. There's a menu of choices available to you. And here's just some that he may be talking about. Of course, they're still using physical force, but using it in a way that is not frontal, okay? like attacking from the rear, or ambushing, or using assassination uh, to eliminate the leadership of their enemy. It may also include spying. Sun Tzu is very big on spying. Okay? The more information you have about the enemy, the less force you'll have to use, because you'll then know your enemy's weaknesses. You'll know exactly where he is, what he's about to do, uh, and what he's trying to fix, and so forth. And you can use that information. <coughs> You can divide and conquer. You can find a way to stir up resentment in the troops of the enemy. You can, you can even foment rebellion against their leadership. Okay? And by doing that, they can destroy themselves. And then you don't have to. Okay? Works well with political leadership as well. Actually, St. Thomas More, who we'll be reading next when we get into socialism, gives the same advice. This is advice that cuts across uh, uh, different ways of thinking, you know, realism, idealism, and, and then socialism, is the usefulness of putting your enemy at odds with themselves. Okay? That is ideal. Then they destroy themselves and they're no longer any threat to you. So uh, it may not seem too uh, nice, but uh, I'm sure it works. All right, so Machia Machiavelli and Sun Tzu both would agree, you know, do as little with, with physical force as possible, do as much as possible with deception, with the use of psychology, uh, plot and uh, scheme, and you will succeed. Uh, now, patience is something that Sun Tzu recommends more than Machiavelli. You may remember... Machiavelli says that the best prince is, is actually bold and somewhat impetuous. They shouldn't wait too long. Well, Sun Tzu also says, you know, too much long delay can make people discouraged. But I think he emphasizes more than Machiavelli this, uh, this idea of patience. Okay? Uh, the lady in the video said, that, you know, uh, Asians believe time is free. Well, I'm not sure you can categorize Asians as believing anything in particular, but... Uh, her point was that you know Sun Tzu, when he's thinking about how to deal with a problem, he disregards time. He says the person who is patient enough to wait until the enemy is in disorder will win. And patience is a real problem with people. You know, for the same reason the enemy may discourage if he hangs out in the field for a long time, so your troops may be. It requires a lot of discipline for you to give them the patience. Okay. Or it may be simply waiting to even launch an attack until you can see that there is political trouble within your enemy's leadership. For instance, when there's a transition in power from, you know, the, the old king dies and his young son uh, is the heir and becomes king. And you know now he probably won't be able to handle your assault nearly as well as his father. That's the time to attack. You may have to wait five years or more 
for that to happen. But you know it's going to happen. Nobody lives forever. So that requires a lot of patience uh, on the part of, and a lot of planning uh, on the part of your leadership. Okay. So, so Sun Tzu recommends waiting until you see that disorder, until your enemy is weak. And sometimes that weakness happens not because you've done anything, but just because this, there are seasons in life for everybody and for every community there will be problems. You may experience a natural problem like a drought or uh, a, you know, a flood, a uh, hurricane. Something will happen uh, that doesn't have anything to do with you but you can come along and take advantage of the disorder that arises because of that. All right. Now having talked about the, uh, some of the similarities that are, you might say, positive, uh, similarities in advice between these two thinkers, there are a couple of ways in which they are similar as far as their, the potential criticisms or problems that they uh, that, that their thought brings up. Uh, one problem that we discussed about Machiavelli's thought was the idea that maybe he was living in kind of extraordinary times. Machiavelli was living at the time, right at the, right at the uh, beginning of the Renaissance, when there was a lot of cultural turmoil, right before the Protestant Reformation, there was a lot of religious turmoil, the church was, was terribly corrupt at that point in time and sort of instigated the, the Reformation. Uh, at a point in time when Italy was, was very divided and the cities were fighting with each other and there was just an incredible amount of political violence. And uh, people were doing things openly that in most societies they would either not do at all or they would do secretly, such as having affairs and, you know, religious leaders having affairs or um, you know assassinations occurring uh, with much more frequency so uh, you know we, we see people asking well is Machiavelli really giving us advice that is for all times and for all places or is it conditioned by his times and really not good unless you live in similar times and the same thing can be said with Sun Tzu okay? And I'm not saying that this is accurate. I actually think there's a lot of good advice that these guys can give that do stand the test of time and do cross over from one world to the next. But uh, it is true that Sun Tzu lived in extraordinary times in China okay, during the Warring States period when there was a lot of violence, prolonged warfare among competing warlords uh, that ended up in territorial consolidation which in the long run was uh, better for people, but at the time uh, was uh, terribly disruptive. And there, were, there was a real need for this kind of advice, a real market, you might say, for the kind of advice that Machiavelli, or I mean Sun Tzu, but Machiavelli in his own times would give, okay, because of the times in which they live. Uh, if you're living in peaceful times or if you're living in a situation where yes the state may have to go to war but is not under continual threat of war and under continual assault do you have to put aside morality to such a degree or are you able to adhere more to some sense of justice when you do have to go to war okay. uh, so those are questions that may be raised uh, against Sun Tzu's advice and then another problem which comes up uh, more with Sun Tzu than with Machiavelli, but Machiavelli has this problem as well. What if the enemy thinks like you do? Okay? Or what if, in Machiavelli's case, what if the people become savvy to your, uh, your deception and trickery? Okay? What if the people that you're trying to deceive and, and, and um, you know, trick actually are able to, to know what you're up to and uh, to do the same thing to you? Okay? Sun Tzu actually anticipates this problem and actually wants to assume it. As part of, part of prudence for Sun Tzu is to assume that the enemy is like him, that the enemy is uh, doing the same thing, thinking the same way, and therefore the need is to think even farther out, okay? to plan even more. So, um, you know, but it is a problem because you know, perhaps if there is nobody who can be deceived, the, the, this strategy would not work so well. Certainly for Machiavelli, if the people ever become 
savvy and wise to the political manipulations of the prince, all of his uh, you know, strategies are not going to work so well. He relies upon people remaining fairly gullible. So just to give you an idea of, um, of this evidence in uh, Sun Tzu, he says on page 74, for instance, um, about the enemy, okay, placatory words and increased preparations are signs that the enemy is about to advance. In other words, the enemy will offer peace talks or some, you know, throw up the white flag, but you should take that as a sign that they're about to attack. If you're prudent, you will take that not as an actual peace strategy, but as a sign that they're about to attack. Just as the ambassadors from Japan were negotiating with the Americans right when they bombed Pearl Harbor. Okay? Uh, violent language and driving forward as if to attack may be signs that the enemy will retreat. Okay? So you, you yourself cannot fall for these tricks. That's the message here. Peace proposals unaccompanied by a sworn covenant indicate a plot. When some of the enemy are seen as advancing and some retreating, it is a lure. So he does anticipate that the, 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 the leader needs to know the enemy may be up to these things too. He needs to be suspicious and not fall for these traps. At the same time, he has to hope that the enemy will fall for these same traps. Okay? This is a tricky game. Okay? This is uh, not easy to carry off, just as Machiavelli's uh, strategy is not particularly easy uh, to carry off. It requires a lot of discipline, a lot of intelligence, and there's some risk-taking involved. Okay? And one wonders, if the world is really like this, as it may very well be, uh, you know, how is it possible to be successful, ultimately? Okay. Or do these strategies, to a certain extent, cancel each other out? And you always have the problem of paranoia. There's a difference between being healthily suspicious <laughs> that your enemy may be up to something and being paranoid. And when paranoia happens, then again, you aren't able to think well. Then you take nothing uh, at face value and everything that you see is a trick. And if everything is a trick, you, you're, out of it. You, you're, you're out of it. You can't think well. All right. Are there any questions about what, what uh, I talked about today regarding Sun Tzu? Okay, that's gotten us up through about page 70, and of course we need to finish the book. Um, but that's what I had on Sun Tzu today. And now I want to turn over here and just talk a little bit about Machiavelli. All right. but, but really, first, are there any questions?